Hi everybody, my name is Antoinette and this is Board Game Inquisition and I'm here to kind of give you insights and information about board games you might want to own yourself. Um, so are you in the mood for something a bit warm, something a bit exotic and definitely economic? Well if so, then here's five things I think you need to know about Marv, the heart of the Silk Road. Marv, the Heart of the Silk Road is a city building game in which you are trying to attain wealth and power from the heart of the Silk Road. On your turn, you'll choose your action by selecting a tile in a row or column and you'll receive its resources. Plus, if you can have multiple houses in the same row, you'll get all their resources too. These actions allow you to use the other areas of the board such as donating to the moss track, increasing your court intrigue, collecting spices and scrolls, and building walls. Because whilst the Mongol horde is approaching, and you'll need to defend your city. The winner is the person with the most victory points after three rounds. Thing one, what's this game all about? So this is a city building game set in the city of Merv, in which you're trying to acquire wealth and influence because after all, this is a city on the Silk Road. Um, and no, it's not a modern day interpretation or anything like that because the Mongols are still attacking the city. And as far as I know, that ended some time ago. Now, your old games aren't necessarily known for having great themes, but I think this one here is quite interesting and robust and one that we're kind of familiar with. I feel like we know a lot about sand and spices as gamers. Um, now, there's been a good effort made to marry theme and mechanics. Um, however, because this game is quite a tight puzzle, I found myself forgetting about the rich setting we were sitting in. Um, the game isn't particularly immersive because you are so busy trying to sort out this puzzle. Now, similar games to this, um, I'm trying to think of other games in which, you know, you go up tracks to influence different parts of the city. And I'm reminded of Stefan Fell's Form Trajanum, but I'm sure there are loads of others. The thing to note with this game, however, is that the puzzle is very, very tight indeed, and it kind of sets it apart from others. Thing two, what kinds of things are you going to be doing on your turn? Well, this is a game that really focuses on actions and there's a very cool way in which you choose them. At the start of the game, all of the action tiles are placed out in a grid on the game board. And at the start of your turn, you place out a meeple um, next to a row of tiles and you can choose a tile from that row to activate. Now, the tiles will always give you resources and will allow you to perform a specific action out on the board. So these are things like donating to the mosque where you can get bonus, you can increase your court intrigue, you can build walls, you can trade for goods, you can collect spices and scrolls, all sorts of fun stuff. Um, now, the cool thing is you get to put a house out on this tile and that means that the next time you activate this tile in either a row or a column, it'll give you its resources again. And so you kind of want to put your little houses together to create kind of big and exciting turns. And the best part is you can also use your opponent's houses too if you feel like it, although they get compensated ever so slightly. Um, but now it's not all stable and safe in the city because on turns two and three, the Mongols invade, which means they take away your houses. Well, all those undefended houses anyway. Um, and the only way to prevent this is by building walls around your tiles or having a little warrior meeple out there to defend your tile. Um, and there's an interesting decision to be made um, whether sometimes you just you know want the tile to be emptied so you could use it again or whether it's worth saving your house in the grand scheme of things. Now the game is played over three turns and there are four goes in each so you get 12 actions in total which is crazy crazy short right and it definitely feels like that. I always felt like when we were just starting the game it already felt like the end um, and because of this I think it gives you little time to kind of explore the game and enjoy it because the puzzle is so important and things are happening very very quickly. Um, this is definitely a game I think that will shine with more players. Even at two players, you play with a dummy. So you can have more houses and meeples out on the board and things like that. It's certainly very, very interactive and I can see it being um, much more kind of engaging the, the more people you had. Um, overall, I think the mechanics in this game are interesting um, and I rather enjoyed playing with it. Thing three on the table. 
So yeah, there's no doubt about it. This is a beautiful game when it's set up. It's bright and bold and colorful and kind of tactile too with all those little pieces. Um, surprisingly enough, it's on a big board, but it doesn't feel like a big game. And I think this is because you don't have any player mats or anything. Like everything's just on the big board. So yeah, it feels quite tidy. And the benefit to this as well is that it's easy to set up and it's easy to put away too. Now, it takes just over an hour for two of us to play, um, but of course those last turns can really be drawn out as people try and maximise as many points as possible out of the game. We felt that the rule book was good, however, it did take us a number of plays to pin down all of the concepts exactly correctly, which is kind of an odd one, I think. Now, replayability wise, I was worried because there, <clears throat> there is so much here that is static. Um, but I, you know, I got to give it to the game. The modular board at the start really did the trick um, and it keeps the game fresh and interesting whenever we played. Think for how does this game look and feel? Well, it's pretty obvious that this game is incredibly, incredibly good looking. Um, Ian O'Toole has shot it out of the park again with another interesting and beautiful design. I do think that colour is this game's strength. It's bold, it's saturated, um, but I also think it gives some issues with legibility too. So for example, there are both white and tan cubes and I find it rather difficult to tell them apart at the best of times. And also just note that people with colourblind issues have had problems with this game too. Um, component quality wise, this game is lovingly made. Everything is very nice, very well put together. Um, overall, this game scores really highly in the aesthetics department. Thing five, is this game actually any good? Oh boy, Merv has given me a number of sleepless nights. And I think that's because there is so much I love about this game. Um, like on paper, this is everything I really, really enjoy in a good Euro. I had so much fun doing the action selection portion where you get to put your meeple out and you select the thing. Um, I also think it's super cool how you can group your houses together and try and build these bigger turns. I had lots of fun going up the different tracks and seeing what bonuses I could get or what things I could earn. Um, everything in this game like is stuff I love and it's fun. The mechanics here are absolutely great. Um, my problem, of course, is these such few turns, you get 12 goals and instantly that puts a, a pressure onto the game and forces you to be thinking with your game hat on from the get go. It makes everything very competitive. Um, so I didn't feel like I had time to explore all of these cool options out on the board and see what they did without giving up my chances for victory. Um, this is a game that seems very, very focused on maximizing your points and your turns and things like that um, because there are so few. And I just personally found it a little bit stifling. Um, like even those tracks you go up, it's not straightforward. They often feel like they have to be used at particular times to get like the maximum benefit out of it. There's quite a bit of timing going on here. And when time is so tight, like I'm just, I'm panicking just thinking about it. Um, and of course there's the Mongols in case you weren't worried about, you know, scoring points at the end of the game you also have to worry about that as well um for me just yeah it was just all a bit too tight of a puzzle now what for me is a downfall is probably going to be a huge bonus to the rest of you because if you like a really tight euro game where everything you do matters then you can't get better than this um you know, I had a lot of fun playing Merv. I, I think it's a really enjoyable game. I just find that the puzzle squares a lot of the fun out of it for me. Um, it never kind of felt relaxed or easy. It was always like, oh, you know, what do I need to get done next? Um, but I think that's also its greatest strength, oddly enough. Um, I definitely would play this game with more people. Um, it's going to be really interactive and entertaining. Um, just probably not with me. So... Do I think you should have Merv in your collection? Well, if you're looking for a stunning interactive Euro game where all of your actions matter, then I don't think you'll find a better game than this. You've been watching Board Game Inquisition. If you enjoyed this episode, why not like or subscribe to the channel so you can get updates about my future videos. It actually helps, you know. Or if you've got any comments you'd like to make about Merv, the heart of the Silk Road, why not shout them off in the comment box below. And tune in again next time for some more short and informative board game reviews.